Uh, this is regarding um, Honky Tonk Man this, uh, from Jeff Susan in Boston. Yesterday on the show, you talked about the situation where Honky Tonk Man refused to drop the Intercontinental title to Randy Savage. Oh, my God, Ted DiBiase is here. <laughs> this actually has to do with Ted DiBiase's career. Ted, how you doing? Pretty good. How are you? Hey, I'm doing really good, Ted. You're on the air with uh, myself and also with uh, Brian Alvarez of Figure Four Weekly. And I was actually in the middle of reading an email about one of the times. You know, yesterday we were talking about your career. And it's sort of like I kind of never thought about this before, and you probably actually did, that you came very close to being the only person ever to hold the NWA, the WWF, and the UWF World Heavyweight Championship uh, during your career. And actually... You sort of held the WWF title for about a week, but you never really won it. Right. And the other ones, you, you actually never got, but you were scheduled <laughs> at certain points. To yeah. Get. It's very strange. Yeah, I'm like the, um, somebody did an article on me, some guy down in Australia, about, you know, the, the guy that was supposed to be champion but never quite got it, you know. But, I mean, uh, you, were, you were, like, you were like right there. I mean, like, I remember with the UWF title, I mean, you went to Japan, you were going to come back and get it, and then the company was sold. Right. Uh, the uh, when they when I came back from Japan, of course, when I left for Japan, I had basically told them that, uh, look, guys, you know, uh, I've been kind of back on the back burner for a while, and I understand that. That's the way things, you know, guys rotate and everything. I said, but uh, look, I've got such a good deal in Japan, you know, either do something with me or I'll just go to Japan. And uh, that's what they were going to do was put that title on me, and then the company was sold by the time I got back. But at the same time. Uh, Bruce Pritchard had gone to uh, New York and uh, applied for a job and uh, had contacted me and said, don't sign anything with anybody until you talk to Vince McMahon because they want you. And uh, so I had uh, basically, I kind of sat around and I had a conversation with Jimmy Crockett and had made a verbal agreement uh, with him. Uh, tentatively, and I said, but uh, before I sign any contracts, you know, I'm going to, you know, search out all my options, and I kind of waited around for uh, the phone to ring, and they didn't ring for a little while, and I was like, golly, well, maybe they forgot about me, and I was about to just go ahead and go with Crockett, and uh, that call came, and uh, I went to New York, and the rest is history. That that was probably, in hindsight, probably the biggest decision of your career, wasn't it? Oh, without a doubt. Um, you know, uh the guy that I have gone to consistently, uh, kind of as a mentor in this business, regardless if I have made up my mind, and I have pretty much made up my mind anyway, but I always run everything by Terry Funk. Uh, and a lot of people listen to me and go, Terry Funk? You know, like, uh, you know, pe people look at Terry and say, well, the guy's like, he's crazy, he's, he's uh, you know, he's, he's nuts, he's still in the business. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Terry Funk predicted everything I've seen happen in the business back when I was in college in the 70s. I mean, he told me when I was a college student in, uh, oh gosh, 1970, uh, you know, four or five, that wrestling was going to come to a point where uh, there would be one or two big promotions that, that uh, guys would start traveling worldwide and uh, would go on, uh, you know, road trips and tours just like, uh, you know, right, right, like rock stores. And uh, all of that has, has uh, lived, I've seen to live it happen. See it happen. You know, you mentioned that, and it just pump. You know, ma makes me remember a couple of things. Is that, you know, I didn't know him as, as long as you did. Uh -huh. But when I first met Terry Funk, and this is early '80s, this is before McMahon went. He told me the same thing. Yeah. Exactly what was going to happen. Yeah. The other thing he told me that, that was was, and this is this is also early '80s, was always watch Japan. Because what happens in that country, as far as the style of wrestling, uh -huh. will predate what happens in the United States. So if you pay attention to how the guys are working in Japan, a few years you're going to be ahead of the curve in the United States. And that was always pretty good advice because, you know, the the, the style with the near falls and all that. You know, a lot of that was, you know, kind of you know popularized in Japan, and then and then came here. A lot of the smaller guys getting over started in Japan and also came here many many years later, like 15 years later. Right. But then it got to. Uh Gosh, I don't know. I'm, you know, I guess I guess I've uh, legitimately I'm 46 years old, so I guess I can consider myself an old timer now. And um, but you know, and I, and I sound like one too because you know when you uh, 
watch what's on television today, I mean, oh my gosh, you know, I, there's no rhyme or reason to anything anymore. It seems there's no storyline. There's no, I mean, and if there is a storyline, it's not in the match. It's backstage. And, uh, you know, uh, you don't have to me, in, in my mind, there's, there's a few, but they, there's not as many or nearly as many as there should be the caliber of, 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 of wrestling workers today as there was, you know, even 10 years ago. It's certainly not. Tw- it's, 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 it's different, it's different demands. It's a different demand, uh, and, I, and I, you know, I, you know, maybe it is supply and demand. But uh, you know, I, as as I watch what I'm watching today, it, it's like as the match takes place, you know, unless there's a, unless it's a Chris Jericho uh, or a, a Dean Malenko, uh, you know, Eddie Guerrero, uh, some of those guys, you know, a Bret Hart, who can go out there and and work that style and work a fast paced match. Uh, and still tell a story. Uh, there is no story. It's just a, you know, it's like a series of, uh, you know, it's just one maneuver to the next maneuver to the next maneuver, and, and they don't mean anything. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like a guy takes, you know, 15 uh, suplexes, and uh, he gets dropped on his head from the top rope to the floor, and then he bounces right back up, shooting back in the ring, and then somebody beats him with a small package. I mean, I don't understand. You know, you know what I thought was always interesting is um, the last couple of days they had at, at the King of the Ring, they, they they spent the whole show trying to build a storyline with Rikishi injuring the shoulder. In fact, he even had this giant bruise on his right shoulder. But every comeback he made, and, and then the next night on television as well, was punching with his right hand. Yeah. With, and, 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 you know, not like punching and then selling like, you know, you, right. you, obviously you know you know how to do it because you probably did it as good as anyone, you know, how to, you know, yeah. work an injury and, right. and, 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 you know, that that whole thing. I mean, it was there was none of that. No. And there, and there is there is none of that today in uh you know, I don't know. Uh, uh, I'm really so disassociated here anymore with with the business. I couldn't really tell you what's going on. Uh, just a little bit that I do glimpse. Uh, but you know, I, I've to me, you know, I mean, I, again, I grew up in the business. I love the business. I love the guys. Um, you know, uh, I'll always have heart for the business, but it's just not. It's not the business that I grew up in. Uh, and I know everything evolves to a certain point, but uh, today, you know, uh, you know, McMahon was the first. I mean, the same guy that took wrestling out of the what do you call it, blue collar crowd type atmosphere, and uh, made it mainstream, dressed it up, cleaned it up, pointed it towards families and kids. Now has gone, you know, over the edge, and it's you know. Uh, you know, let's exploit women, let's exploit sex, let's exploit just about everything we can in the name of the Almighty Buck. And I, I, I am, I'm, I'm very much against it. I mean, you can talk about how great the ratings are, and you can talk about just how many people are watching. Well, you know, that bothers me. It, it bothers me when our society is one that is enthralled with you know that type of entertainment and Howard Stern and Jerry Springer and all this other tabloid television it's like where are we going you know and I guess a lot of that may be do with the direction my life is taken but uh, uh, I just you know I you know I'll put it this way when I can't let my kids turn it on and watch it you know uh, and people say well you know and McMahon would say well you know we're not trying to appeal to the younger audience today I don't think I don't think it's suitable viewing for adults. To be honest with you, um, uh, you know it's it's too much over the edge. I mean, when you got an eighty-year-old woman and you have her uh, take her top off, uh, you can call it an accident. You can call it anything you want to. Nothing on I, that I, show. I prefer not to remember that scene. Yeah, you know, nothing happens by accident. I beg your pardon. And then one night I flipped on there and I saw. Pat Patterson dropped his pants, had this great big stain on the backside of his shorts, and rub it in some guy's face. That's about well, as, you know, vulgar. Uh, I don't know, you know. Well, I, I just want to tell you that you were very lucky you did not see King of the Ring last Sunday. <laughs> yeah, probably, yeah, well. Because, uh, you know, you probably, well, I mean, I know you wrestled Pat Patterson in New York, and, yeah. and obviously you, you came across the Briscoes many, many times in your career. Yeah. And uh, Jack Br- uh, Jerry Briscoe and Pat Patterson had a, you know, a, what was it, an evening gown match? They were wearing you know, a, face, dra- a drag queen match where they were wearing women's clothing, and the object was to rip the clothing off of each other, and it was... It had to be the worst match of both of their careers, wouldn't you say? Um, 
I mean, couldn't. It, I mean, Patterson could have never had a match that bad. I, I mean, no. <laughs> oh boy. I don't want to think about that one either. Your career actually goes back. Um, your stepfather was a was a wrestler. In fact, a great amateur wrestler and a great professional wrestler um, right. that a lot of fans today probably don't know about. But Mike DiBiase had, I guess, legendary wars with Terry Funk's father in Amarillo. Absolutely. And uh, your your mother was also a professional wrestler. So when I mean when you did, when you were growing up, I mean, you're, in many ways that's like similar to someone like an Eddie Guerrero or the Funks. Right. I mean, was it in your mind were you going to be a professional wrestler or did that come later in life? It, it came later. I mean, uh, I don't know. Uh, actually, I, I had my father was pretty pretty adamant about the fact that I wouldn't be. <laughs> and the irony of that is that, you know, here I am, 46, and he dated, he died at the age of 45. And as a 46-year-old father of three boys, I know exactly what he meant. I mean, and I'm not talking about just the nature of, of the wrestling business and what it's become today. But even in the days when I loved the business and, and everything, it's it's the lifestyle that goes along with it that, that – is why a, a parent and a father would say, "Guys, do something else," because you know the the odds of you're making it, you know, big. You know, I was a very fortunate person. I was one of the very fortunate few, you know, that that uh, that you know was at the right place at the right time and got the breaks and uh, was able to, you know, you know, be in town. It's just like Hollywood. You know, for every guy that you see and every woman that you see become a major star, you know, on the silver screen. There are hundreds who are equally as talented who never get the break, and uh, that's the way the wrestling business is. And then, aside from that, you know, uh, you live in a world where you're constantly on the road, uh, you, and it's uh, you know it's kind of like a make believe world because you know uh, you, you know everybody likes you, everybody knows you, uh, everybody's trying to uh, to be your buddy, and and it's uh, you know it's an ego trip. Um, and you know everything else. I mean, how many guys, Dave, in, in the business have died in the last five or six years due to uh, alcohol and drug-related uh, incidents? You know, whether they were accidental or intentional. You know, there's been several, uh, and you know, it, it seems like it never stops. You know, and uh, as a dad, I'm, I'm going, golly, you know, guys, there's got to be a better way. You know, do I love the business? Yes. And would I have changed what I did? No, I would have changed some of the things I did. But uh, I loved it. But I was one of the fortunate few, and I was also one of the fortunate few that came along when wrestling took off and became mainstream, and, and wrestlers began to make you know more than average money and more than just uh, above average money, but great money. And uh, uh, but even today, even today, with the great money that, that a lot of guys are making, there still isn't. Any, there are no benefits. You know, <laughs> you you have your own benefits. So there's just a lot of drawbacks to it. And, uh, uh, you know, my mom and dad, uh, neither one of them really wanted me to do it. My dad died in the ring. He was 45 years old, had a heart attack. Uh, but I'd always had it in the back of my mind. I always loved it. I always loved it. And uh, it was like either football or wrestling. You know, I got a scholarship to play college football. I uh, initially signed with the University of Arizona and then ended up going to West Texas State, uh, largely due to the influence of Terry Funk. And... Uh, and, and largely because I wasn't sure. I didn't want to put all my eggs in one basket. You know, maybe it'll be wrestling, not football. And uh, and wrestling went out. And I just, well, what happened was I went to wrestle the summer between my junior and senior year of college just to make some good money and see if I liked it. Well, I should have never done that <laughs> because I never looked back. And I just kept going. And, you still talk to Terry Funk? Uh, I'm sorry? You still talk to Terry Funk? Yeah, I still talk to Terry. I mean, not on a real regular basis, but a matter of fact, I talked to Terry about a week. As a matter of fact, I was in Texas, and I talked to Terry about a week before he showed back up on WCW, and uh, he had told me adamantly that he was retiring. <laughs> <laughs> and I just laughed and I said, "Terry, I said, I said, you've made a re you've made a career out of retiring." <laughs> Since his first retirement, there are very few people active in this business uh, that were active when he first retired. Yeah, you're right. You're I right. mean that that I mean I don't know what I think that he may have um and you you, you may have been around because okay I seem to remember 
Amarillo Territory. I mean, I mean, his first famous retirement was 1983 in Japan. Right. But I, I seem to remember watching Amarillo Television, which for a very brief period of time was on here in the Bay Area, and you were just on your way out of there to go to WWF for the first time, right. like the North American champion. Right. And I seem to remember them talking about, you know, like, Terry was not on the scene at the time. I don't know if he was, you know, doing a movie or, or what, but I remember, like, they would... They would always refer on television to Terry Funk. You know, it's like, oh, Terry may come out of retirement soon. You know, kind of like the, the, you know, the the guy may come back. I mean, this is when Murdoch and Mulligan were apparently running things. Yeah. So he he may have actually done a retirement like in the <laughs> late seventies. <70s. Yeah. laughs> so, what um you know going going through you know that was like a that was like a big decision for you. Um, your career. Up until that point, the Million Dollar Man, so it's up to 387, you were largely this uh, clean-cut, Jack Briscoe-like, babyface, technical wrestler, great right. performer in the ring. Right. And then you went up there, and, and you went and you became, um, I mean, uh, 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 what would have been like for, for, for you, and even, even you know, a, a 100% gimmick, I mean, still keeping the good wrestling aspect of it once the bell rang, but um, was there any... I mean, when when they presented you with a million dollar man idea, I mean, did, did you think it was going to hit as big as it did? Because they certainly, from day one, went with it like it was going to be a huge thing. Yeah, uh, I wasn't sure. I know, I can remember, um, I can remember Pat Patterson saying to me that uh, that he knew that Vince, this would that this particular idea, the character, of the million dollar man, was was the. Uh, uh, idea solely of Vince McMahon. It was his baby. It was his concept, and uh, and that's very easy to believe because what he created in me in, in, in a character it was he him. Has, he has become in reality. But, it uh, was him. I remember it, when you started doing the gimmick. Yeah. When you started doing the gimmick, I knew it was going to get a push because it was like Vince. Vince is having you being yeah. the like just about the best you know in ring performer play him. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and uh, um, that's exactly what Pat had said. He says if Vince could put the tights on and climb in the ring, this is the character he would be. And uh, so I knew that it was going to get a big push. And uh, you know, I, you know, I I always had uh, faith in my my ring skills and what I could do in the ring. Um, and I knew that I was a uh, you know, and I loved to be in a heel, and that was the deal. I mean, they they knew my talent when they when they brought me out there. You know, uh, they knew what I could do. They knew uh, that I could interview and uh, and carry myself. So I, I felt fairly confident. But no, I never had any idea that it would that it would take off and run as long as it did, and 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 stay as I don't know how to explain this, but even today. You know, of all the characters that came in and out of there and that have been created, it just—it's just one that everybody remembers. I mean, I'm—I'm I'm surprised today, Dave, when I go and I have like young kid, like junior high kids today, who you know, I mean, I haven't been in the ring for what six, seven years, eight years maybe, and uh, they know who I am. And I go, well, you remember me as a manager? He says, oh no, we've we've seen you, and 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 uh, we we watch all the tapes, and we know we know the Million Dollar Man. It's it's like a character that, and uh, overseas, uh, I get a lot of email from overseas, uh, from from Germany and England and and uh, the European countries uh, of fans who uh, you know who remember that that character. So uh, I don't know. I guess I was just a lucky guy. And Let's didn't start he used to give you cash to hand out on the road too, right? To live the gimmick. I'm sorry. Didn't Vince used to give you cash to hand out like when he took, went to bar to buy beer for? Oh yeah, beer? it was it was uh, it, it was like the the biggest you know a fantasy in the world. I mean, Vince says we're gonna we're gonna market you, and the way we're gonna market you is we're gonna you know we're gonna use you to market you. In other words, instead of you know we're gonna we're gonna you're gonna be a walking advertisement of your character. You're gonna you're gonna ride in first class everywhere you go, and every time you climb off a plane, and and people see you come to or from an airport, it's gonna be out of a limousine, you know, and you're gonna stay at the finest hotels. I mean, I lived the gimmick, and uh, and yeah, they gave me a pocket full of cash and said, you know, get the gimmick over. I mean, walk into a restaurant and say, hey, I'm the million dollar man. I'm picking up the tab. Throw down the cash, walk out the door. People will talk, and they did. <laughs> and I said, Vince, what do I do when I run out of money? Come back and get, <laughs> come back and get some more. It was, it was nuts. 
<laughs> Let's go to Dave in Connecticut. Dave, you're first up with Ted DiBiase. Uh, hey, Ted, how you doing? Pretty good, man. How are you? Uh, good. First, uh, like, years ago, like, I don't know if this was real. I was actually at a sports uh, memorabilia show, and I saw somebody who claimed to be your limo driver sell some of your memorabilia, like your, the jackets you wore. Uh-huh. They're going for, like, five grand. Really? Yeah. Wow. Well, that's amazing because I haven't sold any of mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Here's your answer. It, it, that it means like somebody, you, somebody remember, is marketing uh, and selling right my, my, uh, uh, my stuff, but it's not authentic. <laughs> because right every jacket I ever wore is hanging in my closet. It was right after the 1992 uh, Survivor Series, and I remember he was selling the big boss. Uh, he claimed it was a big boss man's nightstick that he used in that nightstick match <laughs> for five wow. grand. A a any anyone could get a nightstick and say that one. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, I I was wonder I never saw like there was kind of a dream match that was uh, going on at house shows, but it, ne it was ne never tele televised as far as I know between you and Ricky Steamboots. Are yeah. those house show matches any good? Because that sounds like a dream match to me. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed working with Ricky very much. I w actually, I wish that I'd have had more time, you know, uh, because, you know, we worked a few matches, but we never worked like a major program, you know, where we went out and, and would have had the time, you know, like I never had the, the opportunity to do a, you know, do you know, 30, 40 minute matches, you know, with, with Steamboat, and I would have loved to have done that. Of course, um, that's a thing of the past anyway. Hmm. Hey, does the name uh, Chris Curtis ring a bell? Um, no. Yeah. All right, uh, if I'm remembering, like, one of my favorite angles that they uh, brought to introduce you, there, there was a match between some guy you called Mr. Washington and Chris Curtis, and you said you were a main event wrestler, so you wouldn't wrestle any scrubs. So you hired, like, Mr. Washington to wrestle for you? And you gave him, do you remember this? You gave him, like, a couple thousand dollars. And then uh, the, the guy you paid a thousand dollars to wrestle the jobber lost, and then you ended up beating the jobber up and taking the money back. Yeah, well, I have no idea who. That, I mean, I, I did so many things like that, you know. Uh, and, and obviously, neither one of those guys were guys that I worked with, you know, worked programs with or worked with on a regular basis. So, uh, you know, I, I can't say that I do remember that. Um, and what was it like? How close did you get with Andre the Giant? I got very close to Andre. Uh, Andre and, and and I were got to be very good friends. My relationship with Andre goes all the way back to college, when Andre was uh, coming through. Uh, you know, he always worked for uh, the WWF. I mean, Vince McMahon Sr. was basically his boss, and then Vince Jr. took took it over. Uh, and he traveled around much like the NWA champion. He would go from territory to territory. You know, and he was a special attraction. And when he came in through Texas, uh, and I was a college student, I would go to the shows, and I would take uh, I would take Andre out after the shows, and take him to the take him to the bar. You know, here I was a college kid, I had no money, right? And so, uh, you know, Andre would, you know, I said, well, you know, boss, I, I'll, I'll take you, I'll take you out, but, uh, you know, and he says, don't worry about it. You, you you don't worry about everything. You just take me, you just take me, and I'll take care of the rest. And he would literally. <laughs> I remember the expression on these girls' faces in these bars where they, he'd ask them, he'd, he'd ask them to take a trash can and clean it out and fill it with beer and ice and bring it to the table. And uh, we're you talking about the we're region. talking about a a a uh, you know a great big trash can, and uh, they would do it, and we'd sit there and uh, I spent a lot of time with Andre Pickled back in those days <laughs> because you didn't hang with Andre and not drink, but. Uh, what a lot of people don't understand about Andre is that in his later years, he was in pain most of the time. He had a very bad back. Uh, he'd had surgery right after, uh, you know, WrestleMania three, the big match between him and Hogan. And uh, there's times if you look at some of the old tapes and you see Andre and I as a tag team, him walk into the ring with me, he's got his hand on my shoulder almost every time we walk to the ring. And it just looks like he's got his hand on my shoulder. But he he had his hand on my shoulder to help steady him. Yeah, didn't I mean, he his back to, like, was that bad. Didn't he used to like uh, walk around, or didn't he used to be in a wheelchair at the airport? That's what I heard. At the, at the very end. At the very end, yeah. At the very end, yeah. Cause, I mean, at the very end, if you recall, um, I think the last time he was ever on an American television, which was an anniversary show on, on TBS, and, um, you know, he came in, and I guess they had a party with Bill Watts and Dusty Rhodes and Andre, and I forget who else was there. But I think Andre was either uh, 
I think Andre was already in a wheelchair by then. If not, he was, you know, he had, you know, two canes. But he was in, in real rough shape by the end. Yeah. I remember, yeah, I remember there was a Survivor Series uh, where he was, like, booked as the captain of a team against the Warriors team. I, I was still, like, like a kid. I was, like, 12 years old. But um, I just remember being so mad because it's like Andre got eliminated. That was back before I paid attention to work great. Like, like Andre got eliminated like before the match started. Like, I guess he couldn't even like wrestle like two minutes at that point. Like, um, I remember it didn't like when he teamed up with Haku. Like, the only thing he did was the elbow, and Haku would wrestle like the entire match. Yeah, Haku did about ninety percent of the match by then. You know, they, they used him as a tag team to kind of keep him. You know. That brings me to another question. I remember Andre was advertised for the uh, 91 Royal Rumble. What was the deal with that? Uh, was he supposed to win? I don't even remember 90. I don't even remember 90. Who was, which, which was the Royal Rumble? What was that? Was that the one that, that... It was like during the... They had the Ultimate Warrior against Slaughter as the main event. Okay, so that's Miami. I remember that. Um, I, don't, I mean, I don't remember the match specifically. Um, as far as... That was that was that one Hogan one Hogan won in Orlando. Uh, Ted, DiBio- Ted, you were in that match against uh, Dusty Rhodes. It was like a, I think it was Dusty Rhodes' last WWF match. Well, I can't. Golly, I it's, can't. It's where Virgil turned on you. I, they all run together after a while for me. <laughs> How does it feel? And you, you sort of actually talked about this earlier. You know, wrestling is something that I guess was was in your blood. In that um, you know you followed it your whole life, and then uh, and you were you were working with WCW until just I don't know what was it, about a year and a half ago or so. About a year ago, yeah. About a year ago, um, and now you pretty much made a, a pretty much a break. Although I guess you appeared on some of those WXO shows. What I mean, how does it I, how does it feel that something that was so big a part of your life is something that you you know really don't like right now, or or at least aspects of it that you really don't like? right yeah, now? Yeah, well, it's. Um well, it, it's sad. It really is. I mean, uh, um, you know, something that was, I mean, it was a part of my life since I was four years old because I grew up in it. And uh, and, and uh, a lot of relationships, a lot of friendships, uh, you know, that, that uh, are, I won't say that the, the, a lot of the friendships have been severed. It's just that, you know, I'm not there anymore. It's kind of like, you know, in the, in the wrestling business, you know, guys... You know, some guys stay in touch, and there's a couple of guys that that, that, that I uh, you know try to stay in touch with. But for the most part, uh, I just don't have common ground uh, with too many of the guys anymore, especially the guys that are still active in the business, um, simply because of the direction my life has taken. I mean, to go from uh, the wrestling business to full time ministry to have to be ordained into the ministry to be an ordained minister, which is what I am today. That's a big jump. It's a huge jump, uh, and it's a long story. Um, and the long story goes all the way back to probably '92, uh, right after WrestleMania uh, eight, which uh, was when uh, IRS and I were tag team champions for the WWF, and uh, and I think that was in Indianapolis, Indiana. But uh, I called home the next day and was confronted by my wife and, uh, on a number of issues because I was living the lifestyle just like everybody else. Wine, women, and song. Let's have a good time. You know, uh, the next town, the next girl, the next party. And uh, you know, I had a wonderful wife and a wonderful family, and I had been a real jerk. <laughs> Bottom line, um, you know, got caught up in being a star, got caught up in, in making the big money, and, and living and living the million dollar man, and uh, realized that I had jeopardized all the things that were truly important to me uh, to feed my ego, and. That was the wake up call. Um, now, as far as my relationship with God, that goes all the way back to my childhood. Uh, I took uh, a relationship with God very seriously as a child, and that relationship carried me through uh, my father's death and my mother's subsequent alcoholism and uh, a lot of things early on in my life, and and basically carried me and gave me the strength and the and and the. Um, the drive to become the athlete that I eventually became and go on to college and then on to the, the wrestling business. But, uh, you know, I just separated myself. I just, uh, you know, the more, the deeper I got into the business, the, the further away I, I drifted. Um, and and not, the, not the business per se, okay? Don't misunderstand that. You know, not the wrestling business, but the lifestyle. Um, and uh, is everybody in the wrestling like uh, is everybody in wrestling like that? No, not everybody. Uh, matter of fact, Mike Rotunda, who was my tag team partner, is probably one of the greatest family guys I've ever known. But I was, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I fell to those things, and uh, subsequently, uh, I turned uh, back to God, and I uh, 
came clean with my wife and much to the uh, displeasure of all the guys <laughs> that one guy said oh Ted you know you just got to come clean and start from there they all of them said lie <laughs> they said don't tell the truth they don't want to know uh, but I did come clean and uh, it was probably a two year process uh, getting back to coming full circle but uh, and I can say today without a shadow of a doubt without a shadow of a doubt that due to my turning back to God and in particular my relationship with Jesus Christ that uh, I have a a closer uh, friendship and a more intimate relationship with my wife today than I ever had before. And uh, not only not only my wife, but my children. And that's the other thing is that as I look back from here, I realize that, gosh, you know, you know, had I not stopped, you know, uh, physically stopped wrestling you know, when I turned 40, which was six years ago, um, how much more of my kids growing up would I have missed? And and man, you know, they only grew up one time, and uh, I missed some of it. But I, you know, by by the grace of God, I didn't miss it all. And there's going to be a lot of a lot of guys, you know, a lot of guys are going to look back on, on some of the, you know, some of those times and say, gosh, you know, I wish I, I wish wish I'd have had them. Like that song, Cats in the Cradle. You know. Oh yeah. Yeah, I tell you what, man. Uh, but I got my oldest son back when he was 13. Uh, my oldest is uh, by a previous marriage, uh, and then I have two sons, Teddy and Brett, who are one is seventeen, one is twelve. The oldest will be twenty three next, well, in September. And I have them all; they're still under the roof, and uh, we're all very close. But um, it's a huge jump, and uh, again, I don't want to sound like, and gosh, I'm sure I'm coming across like that. I don't want to sound like one of those, uh, you know. I'm not bitter at the business at all. I love the wrestling business. I will be forever grateful for the time of my life that I spent in the business. You know, I love to entertain people. I loved what I did. Uh, I, I was successful at it. Uh, I was uh, given a, you know, I'm, you know, I'll always be grateful to Vince for the uh, unbelievable gimmick he gave me, you know, but for all the reasons that I'm happy and, and love the business, today I'm sad because of the direction it's taken. You know, uh, you know, there would have been a time, Dave, when, when you, when I, if I could have told people, you know what, wrestling, you know, you know, holds seven of the top ten uh, uh, spots in cable television viewing and, and holds the, the top three. You know, I'd have been proud of that. You know, hey, you know, professional wrestling beat the National Football League in Monday Night Football in ratings last year. You know, I would have been excited about it, but I'm not. And I'm not excited about it because of the nature of the business, because of the product and what it's become. You know, when you get all uh, these big sponsors, you know, that, you know, and for every big sponsor that, that dumped them, you know, one of them here locally, WorldCom, you know, just dumped them, you know, and it, and it goes right back to the dang thing, dang thing. It's, it's, it's a morality issue as far as I'm concerned. It's like, okay, you know, it's like, well, we, you know, <laughs> What saddens me is the same guy that gave me this big break. I have lived to see him break every principle that he said he ever stood for, and and that's what's sad for me is that it's 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 like well, you know, um, there is some truth in what Vince says though. Vince says, you know what? I'm just giving the people what they want. My ratings are higher than they've ever been. Well, there's some truth in that. And what's that say about our society today? What's that say about what we're going and where, you know, what entertains us? What's next? Are we going to be like, hey, you know, the movie Gladiator was just out. Is that what we're going back to? We're going to start feeding the Christians to the lions in the, in the Coliseums, you know, eventually? Uh, I don't know. But, uh, I know this. In my mind, and from where I stand today, somebody's got to draw a line in the sand at some point and say, that's enough. You know, it may cost me some money, it may cost me some ratings, but I'm going to take the moral responsibility to to uh, to do what's right and not just do what's popular. And uh, the thing is, is that uh, we're all, you know, uh, as I grew up in the business, I can't tell you how many times I heard Terry Funk say this to me, you have to educate the people. <laughs> in other words, you educate them. You know, you, you know, it's by what you tell them on TV 
and and how you you can you can educate them in a direction. And and we're being educated in that direction, you know. Uh, and for all the vulgarity that's in wrestling today, I still believe. Hey, you know what? Disney World is still one of the most popular places to go in the country, and the Disney movies are still, you know, big box office. Um, you know, I, I believe there's been a market that's been left behind. I believe that, you know, the two companies are fighting so hard to, you know, to to win the ratings war that you know it, it's kind of like. My opinion is that Vince has cornered the market on the smut. So just let him have it. <laughs> you know, just take WCW and go totally the other direction and just, you know, program your program towards the families and those people out there. Because there's a bunch of them. You know, WXO died. And the only reason I was part of WXO was because when, I, when they asked me to come on board, and all I was there, Dave, was a figurehead. They wanted me to be the basically the on-air Vince McMahon, and I, my first question was, "Tell me what your programming is going to be, because if you, if it's like what I'm seeing on TV today, I don't want to have anything to do with it." And they said, "No, that's what we want to do. Is we want to bring a wholesome program back on on the air." You would not believe the incredible uh, uh, feedback that we got in those three or four weeks. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, that what happened was that uh, uh, one of the major backers uh, bailed out on him. You know, I never did know. <laughs> you know, nobody ever, you know, nobody ever called me and said, "Well, this is what happened, Ted." It was just kind of like uh, I knew that something had come up, and, and uh, there was a major toy company that was a, a player, and they uh, they backed out. And I, I don't know if it was because they. Uh, Already had a contract with one of the other with, a, with one of the other companies, and they didn't want to have two or what it was. But that's why it died. It wasn't. It didn't die because of lack of interest. There was a lot of interest. We went to NAPTI, and uh, I can't tell you how many people came through there and said, "Man, you know, if this thing goes, we want it." But it just didn't go. Let's go to Chad in North Carolina. Chad, you're next up with Ted. Hey guys, how's it going? Real good. Um, Ted, when you look back on your career, what do you say? Uh, what would you say are your biggest highlights? Oh man, well, uh, without a doubt, uh, you know, becoming a million dollar man in the World Wrestling Federation, as far as you know, worldwide exposure and uh, you know, being on top, uh, that was it. And and I guess the oh gosh, uh, one of the biggest nights. Uh, would have been, you know, as far as the character is concerned, you know, not 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 a match night for any of you, but a, but just a night that will always stick out in my mind is the night that actually that that Andre wrestled Hogan at uh, Market Square Arena because <laughs> you know that's when I had made the, the the brazen statement that I didn't need to win the belt that I would that I would buy it, you know, and that Andre would beat Hogan, and they did the gimmick with the twin referees, and uh, it was the first time that wrestling was on network television uh, since the 50s, and I was a part of that main event, and that was really the, that night kicked the million dollar man into gear, that was, that was the takeoff night. And that was the night that Andre, you know, uh, ripped off Hogan and took the belt and wrapped it around my waist. And, you know, that was the lead in to WrestleMania 4. Uh, uh, that was a major highlight. That's still the most watched wrestling match ever in the United States. Is that right? Oh, yeah. It was, it was watched by uh, 33 million people, which is much, much more than any of these matches now. How about that? Yeah, I mean, because it did a 15.2 rating. The, um, you know, one thing, I, I remember watching that show live um, on NBC, in prime, for, it was in prime time, and uh, what were your feelings in the ring where Andre, you know, I guess it wasn't a big deal, but I just, I couldn't stop laughing when Andre said, you know, he was supposed to hand you the, the world belt, and he says, I'm giving you the world tag team title. Uh-huh. You know, just, uh, I don't know, it's one of those things. Now, now, you were supposed to win the tournament at WrestleMania. Yeah. How far? How far in advance did they come up to you? Like, was it a month in advance, or or how long before they said, Ted, there's been a change of plan. Savage is getting it. Uh, it was a lot closer than that. I don't. Oh, I really? Can't, I can't remember how long, but it wasn't too far out. And uh, to be honest with you, the uh, the uh, uh, the whole uh, it's almost like uh, the the. The result of them not giving me the WWF belt 
was ca- the cause for creation of the million dollar belt. It's kind of like, well, we'll pacify you. Well, you know, you're the million dollar man, and you know, why should this belt mean anything to you? You know, you, when you can make your own type of thing. And I knew what they were doing. Uh, you know, I just, you know, I never played the political game. Uh, you know, maybe I should have. I just was not. I, I wasn't calling Vince McMahon every week, and I wasn't in his ear every 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 uh, you know every day, and, and uh, I didn't play that game. And I don't know. I still don't know. Maybe you know. Maybe you know better than I do. You know why why they chose to put the belt on Savage. I, Savage wasn't happy about something. I yeah, don't know. The, the honky tonk man thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. And um, is it true you were booked to win the NWA World Title? I'm sorry. Is it true you were booked to win the NWA World Title? <laughs> yeah, I was supposed to win that one too. <laughs> and, and it was. Um, what it was then was uh, it was going to be kind of a round robin deal where the concept, uh, if I remember it right, was that they weren't going to leave the belt on one person for so long, and they were going to kind of try to move the belt around between Dusty Rhodes, uh, Rick. Hello. Yeah, Rick Flair and myself, and. Uh, um, I don't know. I, when I went to Atlanta in 80, uh, 81, uh, I was told to go there to get the exposure on the Atlanta television because I was in line for the belt. And then, of course, uh, it never happened. You know, uh, I was there for a while, and uh, although I was doing great, I you know I was doing very good. I was getting over very strong in the St. Louis market. St. Louis, as you know, Dave, was kind of like a it was like a territory, a one town territory. And if you did well in St. Louis and got great exposure and got over, you got you were recognized by just you know all the promoters in the country knew about you. And this was, of course, this was still back when you know the concept of being uh, uh, one territory worldwide was just in its infancy. But I had my first big main event in St. Louis with Harley Race uh, to sell out the Kiel Auditorium, and I believe that was in like an eighty. I don't know what that was. Well, that, might been, that might have been in the late 70s. No. I'm not sure exactly. I just, no, uh, I think it was like, uh, it was like, it was 80, 81. Yeah. It was right around the same time. How's your neck doing? Uh, I'm okay. I eventually, I had the surgery a year ago. I had two discs removed from my neck and replaced with a piece of bone from my hip. And uh, for all practical purposes, I'm okay. Uh, Technically speaking, you know, a lot of doctors told me that I could have had that surgery seven years ago and, and gone back in the ring, uh, and uh, the odds were in my favor that I'd be okay, but I wasn't going to take any chances. So was that pretty much the reason that you uh, ended your career, or was it? Yeah, uh, it was It was a combination of things. Um, uh, I was starting to feel the road. Uh, I had gone through that uh, ordeal. Recently, you know, it was just two pr- two years prior to that that I'd gone through uh, the trial uh, with my wife at home, and I, I mean, it was the realization that I needed to spend more time with my family, that I'd been on the road a long time, uh, that uh, you know I was about to turn forty years old, and I was you know it was forever in my mind that my father had died in the ring when it, when he was forty five years old, and I had. That's one promise I made myself. I said, I'm not going to stay in too long. And, uh, and you know, I, th- I really thought that I would end about 45. But because this came up when it did and the other circumstances surrounding it, I said, no, this is it. This is, it's time to go. You know, I can stay in the business. I can stay, you know, uh, you know, I can manage. I can commentate. I can do something. But I don't have to, to be in the ring anymore. Here's the question. we got a, an easy one, I think, this time. In the late 1970s, Ted DiBiase held a WWF championship. Um, it was not the million-dollar belt. It's a different one. What was the name of the title, and what was the name that fits that title later became? So anyway, uh, for those of you who are fans of WWF late 70s, you'll probably remember this one instantaneously. Uh, before we get back to the calls, I want to ask you, you know, with WCW Saturday Night, I don't, I'm, you're probably not aware of this, but the final episode of the show was actually last Saturday. Uh, the show has been, I guess, moved to Saturday morning, canceled, however you want to call it. And uh, 
when when the thing was first getting on the cable, late seventies, early eighties, that was the, the period you went you went down there. We were talking that we were talking about, and I think one of the most famous angles. And I was just wondering, like, you know, years later, people who were older fans bring this up to me all the time, and we even talked about it on the show not too many days ago. Uh, was the angle that you did with the, the original angle you do with the Freebirds with the pile drivers? Right. I, I remember it very well. Matter of fact, that was. Uh uh, that was <laughs> that angle was done right before I met my my wife. <laughs> um, the uh, uh, gosh, I came to Atlanta, uh, and Ole Anderson had been the, the booker, and Atlanta had had a great run and had kind of died off. Um, the TV was hot though, and uh, so I come in, you know, and I'm being told that. You know, they're going to groom me for the, you know, possibly to be one of the next champions, and, and everything's looking good. The next thing I know, Ole Anderson is gone, and Robert Fuller is hired by uh, Jim Barnett as the booker. Well, look, I got nothing against Robert Fuller. Uh, you know, he was a good worker. Uh, he comes from a wrestling family, but as a booker, you know, uh, he wasn't too hot. And, uh, you know, I had come from Bill Watts. <laughs> <laughs> I had been with the best, you know, who was groomed by Eddie Graham. And, uh, you know, I, and, and I saw things that were just, just, just terrible. And I also saw what he was trying to do, you know. Uh, I, I, you know, he was told what to do with me, but that's not what he was doing. Uh, he was told to feature me. And what he did was he tagged himself up with me. Right, you and him were the big tag team. You know, uh, and basically, you know, uh, that's the way it went. You know, he didn't really, he wasn't going to totally feature me. So if he, you know, to, to, to appease Jim, he put me with him and his tag team. And I remember, oh gosh, that great big. Uh, Frazier. Oh, Lord. It right, was, Stan was, Frazier. Yeah, it was hideous. It was absolutely <laughs> hideous. I mean, some of those things were the most embarrassing things I've ever done on television. And then uh, Buck Robley came in. And Buck Robley came in, and I was familiar with Buck, and had worked with Buck, and Buck had worked for and had booked for Bill before. And that basically was Buck's idea. It was a way to... Uh, to get something going, to get some excitement going, and to to breathe some life back into me because they basically, you know, you know, killed me off, you know, just by association. And uh, so we did the angle with the Freebirds, where uh, I get dropped on my head a number of times uh, on TV, the pile driver, and then actually taken to an Atlanta hospital. I spent a week, <laughs> an entire week in Atlanta hospital. Uh, uh, really? Oh yeah. I, oh my stayed, God, that's the good old days. Yeah, it's been, it's been a whole week there, and uh, uh, that's pretty good because uh, there wasn't a thing wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> we worked the angle, uh, actually. You, you worked know, the hospital. Worked the hospital. Yeah. They, <laughs> oh my. And uh, uh, it was funny too because uh, you know they uh, complained of a neck, you know, neck pain, so they were taking me to to uh, a, a neck. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, physical therapy every day, and of course I'm complaining of pain. And uh, <laughs> you know, I said, you know, and I hit the button, and, and every four hours, you know, you know, you know, bring me the Demerol. You know, if I'm going to stay in the hospital for a week, I'm going to enjoy it. <laughs> so you know, I was pretty much. Uh, at least you didn't find no anything pain. wrong. But I stayed in there for a week and had all <laughs> what, kinds. Of... What if they? What if they found something wrong? Huh? <laughs> What if they would have found something wrong? Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, you're a wrestler as far as, uh, I mean, you know, if you examine any wrestler close enough, you're going to find something wrong yeah, sooner yeah, or later. Yeah, find somewhere, right. Yeah. But, uh, I have a question for you. I remember you did all those angles as a million-dollar man. You'd, like, offer this little kid, you know, a hundred bucks if he'd dribble a basketball ten times and kick it out on the ninth one or whatever. And I assume that most of those were plants or whatever, maybe all of them, but do you ever get a real little kid and screw him out of the money? No, all of all of the all of the TV ones, all of the ones that were uh, broadcast on television, were prearranged and and the people were prepicked. Now the ones that were fun were the ones that were in the live shows, and this was on at the very beginning of the of the gimmick and the angle. Uh, as I would go to you know like my the front, my first two or three times around, like in the, especially the big markets, basically every night. 
you know, every night I would have a match and then grab the microphone and say, I got 300 bucks here for somebody. You know, if you'll, uh, you know, push this peanut hull across the, the ring with, with your nose or, you know, uh, I think the best one, <laughs> the one I enjoyed the most was in Boston, the Boston Garden. I, uh, I said, I got 300 bucks here for somebody. If you will, uh, I said, Virgil, take off my boot. So he unlaces my boot and takes off my boot and my sock. I said, if you'll come in this ring and kiss my stinking sweaty feet. And I couldn't believe, you know, the number of people and this really, really gorgeous, uh, girl. Uh, had her hand up and I said this will make him really hate me so I picked her you know she comes climbing in the ring and starts to, I said no 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 no. you can't just walk across the ring to the million dollar man on your knees <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she gets on her knees and crawls across the ring and kisses my feet uh, it was wild but I mean 300 bucks a night right off the top and everybody was wanting to do it oh gosh yeah it was amazing well, do you, do you, Brian, do you remember when they had Tiger Ali Singh try to copy his gimmick, which yep, wasn't all that... the same deal. The exact same gimmick, and um, he, he got really far doing it, too, but it's another story. He but, got um, what? Oh, Tiger Ali Singh did your exact gimmick, and it was like... I mean, he did it for about eight weeks, and he's never been heard from since. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, the, Often uh, imitated, but never duplicated, right? Yeah, I mean, everybody just saw it as like, oh, my God, you know, we all saw this, you know, we all saw this gimmick. But anyway, the, the, there was a That's guy. not Ted DiBiase in the ring either. Yeah, that was the, that's the other thing. That's right. He wasn't Ted DiBiase when the bell rang. Yeah. Um, the, um, there was a guy. I mean, it was a high school kid. I'll, I'll never forget this. Because um, it was probably, I think they, they said he was like 15, 16 years old, right? Uh -huh. And like uh, Tiger Ali Singh told him, you know, to pick a booger out of his nose and eat it. Okay, yeah. so and, and you know for five hundred dollars or whatever the money was, he did it, and I was just thinking, this poor kid is going to have to go through high school and never have a date, you know, because yeah. it's like, you know, he's on Raw. Everyone's, you know, everyone finds out what's going on on Raw when yeah. it's someone in your school. And it's like, imagine having to spend three years in high school, you know, with with all those, you know, with, yeah. with that reputation. Oh, boy. and wasn't that one of them they did that they never aired? The one that I taught, the one that I just mentioned, they definitely aired that one because I, I, I actually, um, I think that I actually, no, that was this was a different one. There was another one where uh, they did it with someone who was like a reader, and I was like going like, oh, you know, I, I didn't know the guy, but I, I mean, I sort of did, and it was like, oh my god, he's going to be humiliated everywhere he goes for the next six months because he went on and did whatever that humiliating thing was. I heard a little bit about this, but I mean, did they? What did they call this guy? Tiger Ali Singh, right? They they acted like you know his father, and I guess you know Tiger Singh. You remember him from yeah. Japan, you know. So it was his son, and they wanted to bring him in as this rich, you know, um, you know, guy for you know like the uh, the Indian market and all this. I mean, they gave him a big, big push with your gimmick, you know, yeah. as this rich playboy. Right. And every wrestler hated him. His work was terrible, and uh, I think he's in Puerto Rico or got a bad knee, but I mean, he <laughs> he didn't make it. <laughs> There's some. Um, I was going to bring up. Um, do you do you you know I I don't know why this popped into my head other than they Duggan wrestled on Monday night on Nitro for the first time in a while uh -huh. and then they featured him and everything and and um it, it when I, when I saw that one of the things that popped into my head since you were going to be a guest on the show is is that how am I going to phrase this without being too mean to Duggan um I always thought Jim Duggan was a great worker when I used to watch him wrestle you night after night after night and then years later when he stopped wrestling night after night after night all of a sudden. <laughs> was it Jim Duggan that was it was it a different Jim Duggan? <laughs> oh no. Just, it yeah, was I the just, same Jim Duggan. Yeah, and somebody actually emailed and mentioned um a match and I remember this match from Houston, Texas. It was like a Tuxedo Street fight, coal miners glove, yeah. steel cage match for yeah. Paul Bosch. That yeah. you put Jim Duggan over like like nobody has ever put anyone over that I've ever seen probably. <laughs> almost. I mean it was incredible. Well, I tell you, that was, that was, uh, I'll never forget that match. We did that match all over that territory. That was the gimmick matches of, the gimmick match of all gimmick matches. I mean, it's like, it's, it's like eight gimmicks in one. Yeah, eight, eight and one. It was incredible. Yeah. It was dressed in tuxedos, inside a steel cage, coal miner's glove on top of a 10 foot pole, loser leap town. <laughs> so I mean, you were you were you were tearing clothes. You were taking you know all, all of these all of these bumps, and then finally the big bump at the end for the coal miner's glove. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There was um, 
I was going to ask you something because you brought up, you know, with um, with your wife and everything like that. What was the timing? You were wrestling actively in the WWF, and very few people um, leave the WWF voluntarily. Usually, it's injury or it's um, or they're just not wanted anymore. And you left voluntarily to, to work in Japan full time, which actually, as it turned out, didn't last very long. But I, I guess that probably wasn't. Was that all during that period where you wanted to spend more time at home? Or yeah. you, what was yeah. the reasons for wanting to go back to Japan? At it that was point in your well. It was. Um it was a couple of things, Dave. I, again, uh, my personal life, uh, and that happened in '92, and uh, which was WrestleMania eight, and uh, the um, and the territory at the time. Things were things were not great in the WWF. You know, uh, there was a lot of bickering, and, and uh, there was a lot of people uh, that weren't happy and. Uh, of course, you know, but that wasn't, you know, that's the business, you know, business gets good and business gets bad, but, um, the most, the biggest, the biggest reason was, was my personal life, and I, I didn't make that real vocal, you know, I didn't tell everybody, but, uh, I, I realized that I needed to get out of that environment, because the, it was very hard for me to stay in that environment, and, and, uh, you know, it's kind of like taking a, a recovering uh, alcoholic. Where do you where do you put him back in a bar? No, you don't. You don't put him back in a bar. You move him out of there, keep him away from there. Uh, but I, the main thing was I needed more time at home. And, um, and you know, that, that's the one thing about Vince and, and, and Vince's ego is that you know, uh, as long as you do things Vince, Vince's way, you're okay with Vince. But if it ain't Vince's idea, you know, forget it. <laughs> just forget it you know and it was not Vince's idea that I leave when I left and then to, to make it even worse at that time I made a statement to somebody kind of like you know gosh I finally made it out of here and what that was was it was a sigh of relief and it was relief because of the grind I mean you know what the grind is like and I don't know how, what it's like now but I know what it was like then I mean it's like oh my gosh at times three weeks on the road uh Without a day off, uh, and it was the travel. Kind of, the travel when you were there was much harder than it is now. Oh yeah, and it's just incredible. Yeah, and people don't realize the, the idea of you know, like you know, literally twenty-two straight days with double shots on weekends and no days off. Yeah, and it was just incredible, and uh, and it was just it was that was what it was. It was like you know, I'm you know, I'm finally there's going to be some relief, and, the, and there's going to be some you know, like it's not going to be this grind. That's all I meant. Well, that got back to Vince, and it was kind of like you know, he took it like well. Finally, I got out of this stupid place type of thing, and I don't know. He he made an off the cuff remark to me, you know, uh, at the at what is it, SummerSlam in uh, SummerSlam '93? Was that yeah? Razor Ramon, I wrestled uh, Ramon, Scott Hall. That was my last match with the WWF as a wrestler. And then two months later, uh, or a month later, I went to Japan, and my intention was to go back to Japan. And go back on that routine where when I was there, I'd be there for a month. And when I'd be home, I'd be home for a month. You know, it'd be so many weeks a year. And when I was home, I was home for, you know, not a day and not four days or not five days, but, you know, for, for weeks, you know, and quality time. And uh, that's what my intentions were. And then two tours into that, I left WWF in, the, in the August. And by November, I had hurt my neck. And uh, that was it. You know, I, I got out of the ring, uh, and uh, I had a couple of months off there. And I, I think I went to Los Angeles in January to to kind of get back in shape. And I got a call from Bruce Pritchard, and Bruce said, uh, "How would you like to come and uh, co-host? Uh, I think it was the Royal Rumble in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, with Vince." And I said, "Sure." So I went and did that, and. Uh, I said, hey, look, if you like this, you know, uh, I, you know, I can come back to work and, uh, you know, be a manager, commentator. You know, if I'm the million dollar man, you know, I, you know, create the big stable, build me a stable of wrestlers and we'll go that way. And, uh, that's what they ended up doing. That's how I ended up back in the, back in the company. And that was what, just, uh, not even a year later. Well, it was like, uh, the Royal Rumble. I think in uh, February, and then I made an appearance at the 
at the next WrestleMania, which was ten in New York, in New York. I want to also make mention that uh, uh, the trivia question: the first two correct winners were Joe Dennis of Moncton, New Brunswick, and Jerry Moore of Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, the title that Ted DiBiase was held in the WWF in the seventies was the North American title, which uh, later became the Intercontinental title. So, got all the business out of the way. Uh, let's go to Adam in New Jersey. Adam, you're up with Ted DiBiase. Um, first of all, what's up with the mullet, Dave? Uh, second of all, Ted. Yes. Um, old. That's an old. Those are old pictures, guys. Sure, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are actually. But anyway. What is it? Um, Brian, you know, you just like harassed me, you know. <laughs> that is your job, um, Ted. I have to admit, back in the day, I absolutely loathed you because you know you beat up my man, Macho Man. But. <laughs> Um, I was wondering, I, if I remember you should, correctly... You should, have, you should have loved him because, I mean, seriously, he, he uh, those were Macho Man's best matches in the company. Well, you got to remember, I was like, you know, <laughs> eight years old, so I didn't really understand the business. I'm just like, why is he beating on the guy who talks weird? <laughs> <laughs> but, what is it? I, if I remember correctly, like, your last time in the WWF was like 96, early 96, 95, yeah. all that, with the right. Steve Austin thing. Now, why did you leave then? i I know the click thing was huge then, and I'm not sure exactly if they had anything to do with it, but just a question. I'm going to hang out because I've been on hold no, for like I, an hour or so. I, uh, I left the WWF the, uh, the last time largely due to just, again, uh, I had gone back there and been a commentator and a manager. Um, there were my requirements uh, of being around. Uh, basically, was uh, one day a week I would go to the studio and do voiceovers, and once every three weeks I would show up and do the televisions. And that was it. And uh, what they were trying to do was uh, very slowly, I think, move me into uh, being a, a road agent. And I did not want to be a road agent. And uh, basically, uh, I think it was uh, Bruce Richard came to me one day and said, Ted, what do you think about being an agent? And I said, well, I'll tell you what, Bruce. I said, when you tell me how many days a week I'm going to, or a month I'm going to work, and when you uh, start paying your road agents like you do uh, your company employees, make me a company employee with all the benefits and put me on a salary, pay for my hotels and my rent cars, I'll be an agent. That was the last time I heard of it. <laughs> now you you got you got it right right about the time you got the, the WCW offer as well, right? Yeah, and uh, the reason that I and I, I I really I anguished at the time over it because. At that time, the WWF had not, you know, gone down the road that they've taken, and uh, they had been very good to me. And uh, but it was a, it was more it was a business decision. It was I knew I could go to the other company and that I could make more money and work less and and uh, have all those benefits, be an employee of the company, and uh, that that was never going to happen. Working for Vince, uh, and, and you know, I you know it was what Vince wanted me to do. And basically, they put me back. They put me out on the road uh, with uh, who was it, uh, Sid? And uh, you know, I felt like that's the, the way they were leading me, and that's not the way I wanted to go. And uh, so I went ahead and made the move. What were your What were your thoughts? It kind of all happened right in front of your eyes. The the NWO thing happened with uh, with WCW, which was at least in part your idea, um, and also. Um, it got really, I mean, by the standards, it, 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 it upped the raunch factor of wrestling. And it, you were right there kind of like with, you know, you kind of had your beliefs, and then you were on TV, and it was, you know, you were already you were already preaching by then, weren't you? Yeah, well, I, I finally went to, to Eric because, uh, see, when I was brought in there, I was brought in believing that I was going to come in and I was going to be basically the same character, you know, only couldn't call me the million-dollar man, but it was the, the, basically the same image the rich guy with the money that's that's back in this whole deal and uh, but we were the, like the bad guys that were going to come in and run rough, rough, rough shot over this this company and uh, you know, eventually that the, the the WCW and the good guys would rise up and beat us but what happened was that they never did that never did happen by the way no it never did happen <laughs> it still hasn't happened you know and what they did is they began to glorify and make the the NWO cool you know it's like um and I went to Eric, and I said, look, Eric, I said, let me tell you. I said, uh, uh, well, and along the way, Eric decided to jump himself. And he became part of, he saw where it was going, and he jumped right in the middle of it. 
And uh, so I went to Eric and I said, look, I said, here for the last few weeks since you have become the uh, spokesperson, so to speak, you have basically taken my slot. And I said, that's okay, it's working, that's great. I said, but all I'm doing is walking out to the ring and standing in the corner and holding Hogan's belt. I said, I did not put 20 years of my career, of my life into into wrestling to end my career being Hulk Hogan's belt bearer. And I said, that's nothing against Hulk either. I said, that's just, you know, not me. I said, you know, you can get somebody, some other stooge to do that. I said, the, the point is, the more I walk out there and I stand there and I'm not heard from, the less I mean. I said, so I would rather just sit at home. And he said, you've got a very good point. And I said, not to mention the fact that, you know, uh, I have a book coming out. My book is about my life. It's about my Christianity. Uh, you know, I've been on the 700 Club, and I said, it's kind of like everybody knows the business is a work, but, you know, the two guys in the main event don't walk in the building holding hands, you know. So, you know, it kills the mystique. I said, so you might think about that as well. Well, that's when they said, well, just go home and we'll think about it. And then the, the next call I got was to bring me back. And, and again, uh, there's, a, there's a tremendous lack of respect uh, on the part of that company. You know, I don't want to just say Eric Bischoff, but, uh, you know, him as well. Uh, you know, no respect because uh, for somebody that's been in the business as long as I've been in the business and at the, at the, at the top, uh, for him to call me, and, or I get a call, not even from him, but it's like, you know, me in Detroit, you know, and, uh, you know, okay. So I show up in Detroit, and they tell me, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put you with the Steiner Brothers. Well, I didn't think it was really a smart idea. I didn't really like it, but it was there. They had already planned it, and I realized how uh, unorganized they are anyway. So I said, well, what am I going to do? You know, griping about it's not going to change it, so... I went ahead and went and went with it, but the whole point was that I didn't get a phone call. I didn't get. We didn't discuss this at any length. Hey, what do you think? It was like, well, you know, this is what we're going to do, and uh, uh, I didn't like that. And and I was kind of sour from that point forward, you know. Um, uh, and as time went on, you know, <laughs> they began to realize that it made no sense me being with the Steiner brothers as well. You know, it's like. Here's two guys, you know, pretty good wrestlers, you know, okay, they, they, they're not great interviewers, but I tell you what, uh, have become much better interviewers now than ever, they ever were. At least, uh, Scott has. Uh, anyway, it didn't work. So they said, okay, when Scott got hurt, uh, they said, well, you know, go home and, uh, we'll, we'll let you know. Well, I went home and stayed home all summer, and then when I came back, all I came back to do was, uh, Oh, they had me doing NASCAR and just a little bit of something here and a little bit of something there. And it was, you know, I realized then it was pretty much over. Let's go to uh, John. John, you're next up. Hey, guys. How you doing? Pretty good. Good. Uh, first off, I just want to say to Mr. DiBiase, I'm a huge fan, uh, you know, for as long as I can remember watching you. And before I get to my question, I just want to tell you uh, how much I admire you and respect you for your your stand in your Christian faith, um, just being you, you being so willing to to share with others, I think it's just a great thing. Um, anyway, my question was, you mentioned earlier about working with Ricky Steamboat. I was wondering, who were the, some of the other guys during your WWF run that you really enjoyed working with, um, namely the ones you got to work a long program with? I know I remember um, your matches with uh, Randy Savage being really well, and... Uh, any anybody else you really enjoyed working with in the ring? Oh yeah, well I enjoyed I enjoyed, enjoyed working with uh, with Randy. Um, uh, but I tell you, who I really enjoyed working with the most and uh, Jake the Snake. Um, and I tell you why because it was a night off for me. When I worked with Jake, I didn't have to worry about anything. I didn't have to lead anybody around by the nose and tell them what to do every move. <laughs> um, and and uh, I could almost work a match with Jake, uh, you know, and not not even talk. Uh, Jake was that good, and that's a shame. It's a shame that that, that Jake has, has has ended up the way he has, and uh, you know, my heart goes out to him. You know, the guys uh, guys got a lot of problems, uh, but I'm telling you, as far as talent goes in our business, there has never, you know. There, you know, there's not too many equal. Uh, tremendous.
tremendously talented in the ring and tre- uh, tremendous psychology of the of the, of the business, and, as well as uh, very creative mind. Uh, so it was always a pleasure to work with Jake. Uh, I had a pretty good run with the Big Boss Man as well. Uh, but if you want to go back as far as people that I loved working with, uh, let's go back in my career and uh, you know, hey, Dory Funk Jr., Terry Funk, Harley Race. Jack and Jerry Briscoe. Uh, those are some of the guys that I worked with that taught me what I know. And and, uh, uh, and one that, uh, that I really had a good time working with but, but didn't have that many opportunities was Bret Hart. Uh, a matter of fact, I can remember the first time that Bret and I worked. We worked a 20-minute match in Odessa, Texas. It was like a, uh, a match that they were doing for uh, Coliseum Video. And Pat Patterson said, you know, just go 20 minutes, you know, and, and just end with like kind of a standoff, you know, outside the ring, you know, no winner. So we did the match and we came back and uh, Pat was just, oh, going nuts. He said, that was just, a, he said, that was phenomenal. I said, gosh, you know, you guys have been working together a long time, huh? And we looked at each other and looked at him and said, Pat, that's the first match we ever had. And what that was was just two guys that came from the same school. They went out in the ring and uh, had that same feel and, uh, and, and the respect and knowledge of the ring and, and, the, and, and the business, and uh, we just went and had a match. Do you, do you have, like, a one favorite? I mean, and this, this is a tough question, being all the matches you've seen. Do you have a favorite match you've ever seen and a favorite match you've ever been in? Whew, wow. I don't know that I could pick a, a favorite match that I've ever the most the, the most favorite match that I've ever been in. Uh, there, there's, there there's been too many that I really liked. Uh, but as far as matches that I watched, uh, and it'd be hard to pick one, but Dory Funk Jr. and Jack Briscoe had, in my opinion, some of the most classic uh, wrestling matches uh hour-long wrestling matches where it was a contest and they made it a contest and they went and they battled and it was never boring and it kept you in suspense. Some of the greatest uh, technical matches that I've ever seen were between those two guys. Uh, you know, tremendous. About a, about a year ago, I actually watched a tape of a 60-minute match that those two had in Japan and what was real interesting is they did a 60-minute match and at no point did either of them ever come close to playing to the crowd. Yeah. I mean, it was that their eyes were on each other. Their eyes were never on the crowd. They were never. The crowd reacted to what they did based on what they did, but they did not like. You know, they didn't cheerlead. They didn't do. I mean, exactly. they didn't do anything that I would even call work. I mean, it was amazing watching because they weren't working the crowd. They were working. Yeah. Basically, they they were working a shoot, except it wasn't a shoot. See, and that exactly, and that's the way that I was taught the business uh, at, at the beginning uh, is. You know, but the only thing is, the only time you can work that way is when you have some, again, when I worked with Brett, that's the way I worked. You know, um, you can't work that way with somebody who doesn't know how. Or if you have got to, that's just like when I started working with Junkyard Dog, you know, as talented as JYB was, his talent was his, his charisma, his ability to uh, communicate with the people and do interviews. He was not tremendously talented in the ring. And I can remember Terry Funk telling me, he said, Ted, he says, you've got to work around him. You know, and basically, it's like he's standing in the middle of the ring, and you've got to bounce off of him and make the match exciting around him. And and that's what I did with him, and that's what I did with uh, uh, a number of people. I won't name any names. <laughs> there was um, you know, bring you? a... What, what, go ahead, Brian. I just wanted to train you. I'm sorry. Oh, he, who, uh, who, tra- you? Who, who's your, who originally trained you? Who originally trained me? Well, I can't give any one person credit, but the, uh, here the, there's a list of guys that had that a lot to do with it. Uh, but uh, Dick Murdoch, tremendous talent. Uh, Carl Cox, uh, uh, Terry Funk and Dory Funk Jr. Uh, Harley Race had a great deal to do with it, uh, and Bill Watts. Overall, I worked for Bill more years than anybody before going to the WWF. Uh, and again, he was he was you know he was tutored by uh, one of the best, Eddie Graham. Before before we go, I want you know the story you actually told me. Um, 
you know, you were almost typecast as a babyface, certainly in the early p- portion of your career. Right. And your your big heel run, which was really, you know, something that I, I guess you were almost the most unlikely heel, but yet it was probably one of the most, you know, up until before the WF, probably the biggest program you ever had was with uh, was when you turned on JYD. Exactly. And uh, that all happened. As a matter of fact, guys like Paul Orndorff were moving to the WWF. Paul had gone, and I think... Uh, the Samoans had gone back up there, and uh, 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 Ernie Ladd was booking for Bill Watts, and Ernie came to me and he said, "Ted, he says you and JYD are baby faces. You know, it's kind of like salt and pepper, you know. And uh, but we need a real good heel. And uh, 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 you got to be looking around. Got to be looking around for a good heel. And." Uh, and be thinking. So I said, okay, we'll do that. So I got to thinking about it. And I remember I had teased JYD and said to him, I said, you know what, man? I said, I'm going out there and I'm busting my rear end every night. I'm working 30 minutes and 40 minutes. I said, you're shaking your backside, dancing to the ring to that music, howling when you hit the ring. You work five minutes, the match is over, and you're making all the money. You know, and he was like, he was like one of my best friends. And, uh, and he just laughed, boy. And so, it just dawned on me. I just one night riding down the road, I said, "Who would ever believe?" I mean, I, I grew up in this territory. They they knew me from rookie on up, and I'd leave and come back, and I was still that sweet good guy. And I said, "Who would ever believe that I would turn on the dog?" And I went to uh, Ernie Ladd's hotel room in uh, Shreveport, knocked on the door, and I said, "Ernie, I found your heel." And he said, "Who?" And I said, "You're looking at him." And his eyes got as big as saucers. He just said, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and he sat down. He says, I, I, I. He says, I, I, I. <laughs> and I said, I know. And he says, that. I said, nobody, he says, nobody would ever think it. And I said, you're right. And that's now, how. We, Ted, we're, we're like totally out of time. Okay. I, w- I want to thank you very much. This was a great show. I really, I really enjoyed this one. Um, and I want to remind everyone, uh, Brian, I want to thank you as well. And uh, we will be back here tomorrow.